Good afternoon. Uh, I wanted to spend a little time talking about the most interesting prompt that I saw in the list that was offered. It was about the Dragonfly 44 galaxy. My discussion today, or my talk today, is about the discovery and what it means. Uh, also, to get some background together on, have we seen this before? And then, since I cut off the discovery a, a little early, I'll pick it up again about halfway through the talk. And then try to answer the question, perhaps, although there are lots of different uh, explanations, and including the ones that are in the paper that was written for, for this discussion as to how this could have happened. So the discovery, uh, Dragonfly uh, 44 is what is called a diffuse or ultra diffuse galaxy. Uh, as you can see here in this blow up, uh, it's sitting in the middle of the square and it just looks like a very faint uh, glow of light, but in fact, it is a large galaxy. Um, so some stats about uh, that particular thing are as far as the stellar material, um, it's it's fairly small from what can be seen. About three times 10 to the eighth uh, passes of the sun make up its stellar content. Uh, on the other hand, it's uh, effective radius, which is uh, given here, um, is not uh, unusual for a regular galaxy. It's, in other words, it's not a tiny galaxy. Um, but the, of course, the uh, thing that got my attention and probably got yours as well about this particular topic is that the uh, lead in to the paper is that uh, it is considered to be 98% dark matter. So that's a pretty heavy number. And since we've typically been looking at the universe as a whole and thinking that of all of the matter in the universe, about 80% of it is perhaps dark matter, but then finding this, this much matter in a particular galaxy uh, was a surprise. So uh, do we have any background on this? Well, yes, we do. We've spent uh, a lot of this term talking about galaxies and dark matter. Uh, and in this particular case, uh, we're all familiar with Kepler's theories and that the expectation is that for uh, stellar systems like our sun um, uh, revolving around the center of the galaxy, uh, the expectation uh, based off of Kepler's laws is that the uh, rotational, uh, uh, the radial velocity, uh, really, of the uh, the uh, galaxies that uh, uh, are the, the the suns and the stellar systems that uh, make up the, the galaxies, uh, the the as the distance increases, the velocity uh, around those should go down, as is illustrated here with the uh, line A, the dotted blue line. However. What we, ha we have seen uh, observed uh, over many uh, examinations of galaxies is that after a high point, the, uh, the velocities sort of flatten out, uh, not totally 100% consistent, but still a roughly a, a flat line once you get to that, that high point and it doesn't go down over time. So we know from our work this year, that uh, the implication here is, of course, that much of the matter in a galaxy is dark matter. That's what keeps uh, the speed of the uh, rotating stellar systems going. Another place that we've seen uh, this kind of effect before is in globular clusters, uh, where when you're just looking at the, the uh, clusters themselves, it looks like they might be fly, they might be able to fly apart, or at least uh, uh, leave the neighborhood because there isn't enough uh, gravitational pull to keep them there. But we looked at an example, the coma cluster, uh, and we looked at the stellar mass, uh, which uh, upon observation of all of the stellar materials that is there is about 10 to the 13th uh, solar masses. 
at the same time, looking at the gas that's in, in that uh, particular cluster, uh, it looks like that there's about 10 to the 14th stellar masses of gas in the cluster. But when we do the formal calculation as to uh, what the total mass is of um, the, the coma cluster, it turns out to be in the order of magnitude of 10 to the 15 solar masses. And as you can see, from, just from my looking at that, that that's about 100 times more than the total amount of gas. I mean, it's 10, 10 times more than the total amount of gas and about 100 times more than the total amount of stellar material. So again, the implication here is that much of the mass of clusters is dark matter, and that's what pretty much holds them together. We also looked at gravitational lensing. Of course, this came out of Einstein's original work, and based off of his work, we know that we can calculate this angle of deflection. This is a light uh, photon coming from, let's say, a, a distant uh, galaxy that is hiding behind a cluster, let's say a cluster here in front, and the light that's coming from that galaxy is bent around the cluster because uh, lights uh, affect based off of uh, gravity bending uh, space time. So we can calculate this angle of deflection, and this ends up with something called the Einstein ring, of course, um, that we'll, we'll see in a, in a second. But using this formula and then solving for mass, we can get the total amount of mass that is here in this cluster, and it's not just the mass that we see visible. There is, in fact, the implication that when there's an Einstein ring and the this uh, uh, image of this doc, this object that we're seeing here, in this instance, it seems to be a cluster, and in the background there's material smeared around a ring. The implication is the reason for that is that Einstein's quite right that there's a big mass in there based off of this uh, formula, and that dark matter is really there to make uh, this ring happen. Now, this is not really something that we have seen before, but we have previously understood that uh, there is no dark matter in the solar system. Uh, the planets move according to Kepler's laws. It's nice and smooth, so there's no impact there. But some folks have begun to question this idea, and new studies are currently underway uh, by NASA uh, in, in conjunction with other folks uh, to do an external, well, sort of an external view of the solar system uh, to try to find out if there is evidence of dark matter even within our galaxy. So getting back to um, the issue here, which was that this astounding number here that we see for the amount of dark matter, the fraction of matter, all the matter uh, that is in uh, uh, Dragonfly 44. Well, I'm going to take the, the cover off and share with you the Milky Way's stats. So the Milky Way, uh, this is again uh, solar masses. Um, you can see that the Milky Way's uh, total mass in stellar masses is huge compared to what's in Dragonfly 44. At the same time, and this is again under discussion because maybe the, uh, the effective radius is not um, something that everybody can agree upon. In fact, you see here that I have a number for the Milky Way from this particular paper, and it's a smaller number than for, for, for uh, Dragonfly 44. Um, some question about whether or not that, that's real or not, but my uh, view of it is that they still are in the same ballpark. This is roughly the same order of magnitude. So that seems to say that Dragonfly 44 and the Milky Way are roughly uh, the same uh, order of magnitude as far as the size of the galaxy. However, when you look at the matter, the stellar matter anyway, that makes up uh, Dragonfly, it's only about 0.03% of that of the Milky Way. So that's that's way small for something that's roughly equivalent. That, the, that there's no real significance there in the, the 172. It's, it's just trying to show that it's close to 100% in one way or another. Now, the other thing that 
I found quite uh, surprising, particularly because I was I was a little shocked by the 98% number for Dragonfly 44. But then I found the recent number that's published by NASA that 95% of the uh, matter that makes up the Milky Way is dark matter. It's not the 80% uh, number that we've been thinking about for the universe, but it's in fact um, a very, very high amount of the universe is dark matter. And roughly, so at that, when you look at it that way, my original surprise at the 98% for Dragonfly 44 was even, I was even more surprised by the Milky Way number at 95%. So how can it be that there's dark matter like this everywhere we look apparently, and apparently in very large supply? Well, the first part of the semester, we were looking at uh, uh, cosmology and amongst other things, an understanding of the cosmic microwave background. And as illustrated here, uh, we know that at large scales, it's homogenous and isotropic, but we also know that there are significant, at, at smaller scales, there are significant hot spots and cold spots, meaning places where there's a high concentration of, of material. And in, for example, in this area over here, it's really uh, intense. It's a much higher reddish almost color. And instead, uh, where there are, it's a lack of that matter, of that material, uh, you see these really uh, dark, deep blue areas where it's, it's basically empty. So um, my point here is that although this is not the argument that was being made in the paper by uh, the, the writers of the paper that I was reading for this uh, particular exercise, um, but uh, way back when, the CMB set up the stage for the big structures in the universe. And of course, since uh, dark matter was a part of that recipe, um, then why wouldn't dark matter be here and there and pretty much everywhere? So the question is, are there wimps hiding under your table? In fact, are there wimps all around, inside and outside, even inside of us, maybe? Um, it's a question. Love to hear the answer. I, I'm sure that you're thinking some of the similar ideas or some are similar thoughts. Uh, I'd love to hear some of you share those thoughts about this particular issue. Dark matter seems to be real enough, uh, after all. Uh, and we really would like to know, is it in the, our solar system and, and on uh, Earth and within us? I hope you enjoyed this discussion and uh, have a good day.